Chapter Sixteen of Baron Trigot's Vengeance by Emile Gaboriau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixteen. Stupefied with astonishment, Monsieur Wilkie stood for a moment silent and motionless. Allow me, he faltered at last. Allow me. I, I wish to explain. But Madame d'Argelet did not even turn her head. The door closed behind her, and he was left alone however strong a man's nature may be he always has certain moments of weakness for instance at the present moment wilkie was completely at a loss what to do not that he repented he was incapable of that but there are hours when the most hardened conscience is touched and when long dormant instincts at last assert their rights if he had obeyed his first impulse he would have darted after his mother and thrown himself on his knees before her but reflection remembrance of the viscount de corath and the marquis de valorsay made him silent the noblest voice that had spoken in his soul for many a long day so with his head proudly erect he went off twirling his moustaches and followed by the whispers of the servants whispers which were ready to change into hisses at any moment but what did he care for the opinion of these plebeians before he was a hundred paces from the house his emotion had vanished and he was thinking how he could most agreeably spend the time until the hour appointed for his second interview with m de valorsay he had not breakfasted but his stomach was out of sorts as he said to himself and it would really have been impossible for him to swallow a morsel thus not caring to return home he started in quest of one of his former intimates with the generous intention of overpowering him with the great news unfortunately he failed to find this friend and eager to vent the pride that was suffocating him in some way or other he entered the shop of an engraver whom he crushed by his importance and ordered some visiting cards bearing the inscription w de gordon chalus with a count's coronet in one of the corners thus occupied time flew by so quickly that he was a trifle late in keeping his appointment with his dear friend the marquis wilkie found m de valorsay as he had left him in his smoking-room talking with the viscount de corral not that the marquis had been idle but it had barely taken him an hour to set in motion the machinery which he had had in complete readiness since the evening before victory cried wilkie as he appeared on the threshold it was a hard battle but i asserted my rights i am the acknowledged heir the millions are mine and without giving his friends time to congratulate him he began to describe his interview with madame d'argelet presenting his conduct in the most odious light possible pretending he had indulged in all sorts of harsh rejoinders and making himself out to be a man of bronze or a block of marble as he said you are certainly more courageous than i fancied said m de valorsay gravely when the narrative was ended is that really so it is indeed now the world is before you let your story be noised abroad and it will be noised abroad and you will become a hero imagine the amazement of paris when it learns that lia d'argelet was a virtuous woman who sacrificed her reputation for the sake of her son a martyr whose disgrace was only a shameful falsehood invented by two men of rank to increase the attractions of their gambling den it will take the newspapers a month to digest this strange romance and whom will all this notoriety fall upon upon you my dear sir and as your millions will lend an additional charm to the romance you will become the lion of the season m wilkie was really too much overwhelmed to feel elated upon my word you overpower me my dear marquis you quite overpower me he stammered i too have been at work resumed the marquis and i have made numerous inquiries in accordance with my promise i almost regret it for what i have discovered is very singular to say the least i was just saying to corath when you came in what i have learned makes it extremely unpleasant for me to find myself mixed up in the affair accordingly i have requested the persons who gave me this information to call here you shall hear their story and then you must decide for yourself so saying he rang the bell and as soon as a servant answered the summons he exclaimed show m casimir in 
when the lackey had retired to carry out this order the marquis remarked casimir was the deceased count's valet he is a clever fellow honest intelligent and well up in his business such a man as you will need in fact and i won't try to conceal the fact that the hope of entering your service has aided considerably in unloosening his tongue m casimir who was irreproachably clad in black with a white cambric tie round his neck entered the room at this very moment smiling and bowing obsequiously this gentleman my good fellow said m de valorsay pointing to wilkie is your former master's only heir a proof of devotion might induce him to keep you with him what you told me a little while ago is of great importance to him see if you can repeat it now for his benefit in his anxiety to secure a good situation m casimir had ventured to apply to the marquis de valorsay he had talked a good deal and the marquis had conceived the plan of making him an unsuspecting accomplice i never deny my words replied the valet and since monsieur is the heir to the property i won't hesitate to tell him that immense sums have been stolen from the late count's estate monsieur wilkie bounded from his chair immense sums he exclaimed is it possible monsieur shall judge on the morning preceding his death the count had more than two millions in banknotes and bonds stowed away in his escritoire but when the justice of the peace came to take the inventory the money could not be found we servants were terribly alarmed for we feared that suspicion would fall upon us ah if wilkie had only been alone he would have given vent to his true feelings but here under the eye of the marquis and m de corral he felt that he must maintain an air of stoical indifference he almost succeeded in doing so and in a tolerably firm voice he remarked this is not very pleasant news two millions that's a good haul tell me my friend have you any clue to the thief the valet's troubled glance betrayed an uneasy conscience but he had gone too far to draw back i shouldn't like to accuse an innocent person he replied but there was some one who constantly had access to that escritoire and who was that mademoiselle marguerite i don't know the lady she's a young girl who is at least people say the count's illegitimate daughter her word was law in the house what has become of her she has gone to live with general de fondage one of the count's friends she wouldn't take her jewels and diamonds away with her which seemed very strange for they are worth more than a hundred thousand francs even bourigeot said to me that's unnatural monsieur casimir Borigeot is the concierge of the house a very worthy man monsieur will not find his equal unfortunately this tribute to the merits of the valet's friend was interrupted by the arrival of a footman who after tapping respectfully at the door entered the room and exclaimed the doctor is here and desires to speak with monsieur le marquis very well replied monsieur de valorsay ask him to wait when i ring you can usher him in then addressing m casimir he added you may retire for the present but don't leave the house m wilkie will acquaint you with his intentions by and by the valet thereupon backed out of the room bowing profoundly there is a story for you exclaimed m wilkie as soon as the door was closed a robbery of two millions the marquis shook his head and remarked gravely that's a mere nothing i suspect something far more terrible what pray upon my word you frighten me wait i may be mistaken even the doctor may be deceived but you shall judge for yourself as he spoke he pulled the bell-rope and an instant after the servant announced dr jodon it was indeed the same physician who had annoyed mademoiselle marguerite by his persistent curiosity and impertinent questions at the count de chalus's bedside the same crafty and ambitious man constantly tormented by covetousness and ready to do anything to gratify it the man of the period in short who sacrificed everything to the display by which he hoped to deceive other people and who was almost starving in the midst of his mock splendour m casimir was an innocent accomplice 
but the doctor knew what he was doing interviewed on behalf of the marquis de valorsay by madame leon he had fathomed the whole mystery at once these two crafty natures had read and understood each other no definite words had passed between them they were both too shrewd for that and yet a compact had been concluded by which each had tacitly agreed to serve the other according to his need as soon as the physician appeared m de valorsay rose and shook hands with him then offering him an armchair he remarked i will not conceal from you doctor that i have in some measure prepared this gentleman designating m wilkie for your terrible revelation by the doctor's attitude a keen observer might have divined the secret trepidation that always precedes a bad action which has been conceived and decided upon in cold blood to tell the truth he began speaking slowly and with some difficulty now that the moment for speaking has come i almost hesitate our profession has painful exigencies perhaps it is now too late if there had been any of the count's relatives in the house or even an heir at the time i should have insisted upon an autopsy but now on hearing the word autopsy m wilkie looked round with startled eyes he opened his lips to interrupt the speaker but the physician had already resumed his narrative besides i had only suspicions he said suspicions based it is true upon strange and alarming circumstances i am a man that is to say i am liable to error in the kingdom of science it would be unpardonable temerity on my part to affirm to affirm what interrupted m wilkie the physician did not seem to hear him but continued in the same dogmatic tone the count apparently died from an attack of apoplexy but certain poisons produce similar and even identical symptoms which are apt to deceive the most experienced medical men the persistent efforts of the count's intellect his muscular rigidity alternating with utter relaxation the dilation of the pupils of his eyes and more than aught else the violence of his last convulsions have led me to ask myself if some criminal had not hastened his end whiter than his shirt and trembling like a leaf m wilkie sprang from his chair i understand he exclaimed the count was murdered poisoned but the physician replied with an energetic protest oh not so fast said he don't mistake my conjectures for assertions still i ought not to conceal the circumstances which awakened my suspicions on the morning preceding his attack the count took two spoonfuls of the contents of a vial which the people in charge could not or would not produce when i asked what this vial contained the answer was a medicine to prevent apoplexy i don't say that this is false but prove it as for the motive that led to the crime it is apparent at once the escritoire contained two millions of francs and the money has disappeared show me the vial find the money and i will admit that i am wrong but until then i shall have my suspicions he did not speak like a physician but like an examining magistrate and his alarming deductions found their way even to m wilkie's dull brain who could have committed the crime he asked it could only have been the person likely to profit by it and only one person besides the count knew that the money was in the house and had possession of the key of this escritoire and this person is the count's illegitimate daughter who lived in the house with him mademoiselle marguerite m wilkie sank into his chair again completely overwhelmed the coincidence between the doctor's deposition and m casimir's testimony was too remarkable to pass unnoticed further doubt seemed impossible ah this is most unfortunate faltered wilkie what a pity such difficulties never assail any one but me what am i to do and in his distress he glanced from the doctor to the marquis de valorsay and then at m de Corelt, as if seeking inspiration from each of them my profession forbids my acting as an adviser in such cases replied the physician but these gentlemen have not the same reasons for keeping silent excuse me interrupted the marquis quickly 
but this is one of those cases in which a man must be left to his own inspirations the most i can do is to say what course i should pursue if i were one of the deceased count's relatives or heirs pray tell me my dear marquis sighed wilkie you would render me an immense service by doing so m de valorsay seemed to reflect for a moment and then he solemnly exclaimed i should feel that my honour required me to investigate every circumstance connected with this mysterious affair before receiving a man's estate one must know the cause of his death so as to avenge him if he has been foully murdered for m wilkie the oracle had spoken such is my opinion exactly he declared but what course would you pursue my dear marquis how would you set about solving this mystery i should appeal to the authorities ah and this very day this very hour without losing a second i should address a communication to the public prosecutor informing him of the robbery which is patent to any one and referring to the possibility of foul play yes that would be an excellent idea but there is one slight drawback i don't know how to draw up such a communication i know no more about it than you do yourself but any lawyer or notary will give you the necessary information are you acquainted with any such person would you like me to give you the address of my business man he is a very clever fellow who has almost all the members of my club as his clients this last reason was more than sufficient to fix m wilkie's choice where can i find him he inquired at his house he is always there at this hour come here is a scrap of paper and pencil you had better make a note of his address write montmejean route de la revolte tell him that i sent you and he will treat you with the same consideration as he would show to me he lives a long way off but my brougham is standing in the courtyard so take it and when your consultation is over come back and dine with me ah you are too kind exclaimed m wilkie you overpower me my dear marquis you do upon my word i shall fly and be back in a moment he went off looking radiant and a moment later the carriage which was to take him to m montmejean's was heard rolling out of the courtyard the doctor had already taken up his hat and cane you will excuse me for leaving you so abruptly monsieur le marquis said he but i have an engagement to discuss a business matter indeed i am negotiating for the purchase of a dentist's establishment what you yes i you may tell me that this is a downfall but i will answer it will give me a living medicine is becoming a more and more unremunerative profession however hard a physician may work he can scarcely pay for the water he uses in washing his hands i have an opportunity of purchasing the business of a well-established and well-known dentist in an excellent neighbourhood why not avail myself of it only one thing worries me the lack of funds the marquis had expected the doctor would require remuneration for his services before compromising himself any further m jodon wished to know what compensation he was to receive the marquis was so sure of this that he quickly exclaimed ah my dear doctor if you have need of twenty thousand francs i shall be only too happy to offer them to you really upon my honour and when can you let me have the money in three or four days time the bargain was concluded the doctor was now ready to find traces of any poison whatsoever in the count de chaluse's exhumed remains he pressed the marquis's hand and then went off exclaiming whatever happens you can count upon me left alone with the viscount de corel and consequently freed from all restraint m de valorsay rose with a long-drawn sigh of relief what an interminable seance he growled and approaching his acolyte who was sitting silent and motionless in an armchair he slapped him on the shoulder exclaiming are you ill that you sit there like that as still as a mummy the viscount turned as if he had been suddenly aroused from slumber i'm well enough he answered somewhat roughly i was only thinking 
your thoughts are not very pleasant to judge from the look on your face no i was thinking of the fate that you are preparing for us oh a truce to disagreeable prophecies please besides it's too late to draw back or to even think of retreat the rubicon is past alas that is the cause of my anxiety if it hadn't been for my wretched past which you have threatened me with like a dagger i should long ago have left you to incur this danger alone you were useful to me in times past i admit you presented me to the baroness trigault to whose patronage i owe my present means but i am paying too dearly for your services in allowing myself to be made the instrument of your dangerous schemes who aided you in defrauding camille bay who bet for you against your own horse domingo who risked his life in slipping those cards in the pack which pascal ferrailleur held it was corat always corat a gesture of anger escaped the marquis but resolving to restrain himself he made no rejoinder it was not until after he had walked five or six times round the smoking-room and grown more calm that he returned to the viscount's side really i don't recognize you he began is it really you who have turned coward and at what a moment pray why on the very eve of success i wish i could believe you facts shall convince you this morning i might have doubted but now thanks to that vain idiot who goes by the name of wilkie i am sure perfectly mathematically sure of success montmejean who was entirely devoted to me and who is the greediest most avaricious scoundrel alive will draw up such a complaint that marguerite will sleep in prison moreover other witnesses will be summoned by what casimir has said you can judge what the other servants will say this testimony will be sufficient to convict her of the robbery as for the poisoning you heard dr jodon can i depend upon him evidently if i pay without haggling very well i shall pay but all this did not reassure m de corat the accusation will fall to the ground said he as soon as the famous phial from which m de chalus took two spoonfuls is found excuse me it won't be found but why because i know where it is my dear friend it is in the count's escritoire but it won't be there any longer on the day after to-morrow who will remove it a skilful fellow whom madame leon has found for me everything has been carefully arranged to-morrow night at the latest madame leon will let this man into the hotel de chalus by the garden gate which she has kept the key of ventresson as the man is called knows the management of the house and he will break open the escritoire and take the vial away you may say that there are seals upon the furniture placed there by the justice of the peace that's true but this man tells me that he can remove and replace them in such a way as to defy detection and as the lock has been forced once already the day after the count's death a second attempt to break the escritoire open will not be detected the viscount remarked with an ironical air all that is perfect but the autopsy will reveal the falseness of the accusation naturally but an autopsy will require time and that will suit my plans admirably after eight or ten days solitary confinement and several rigid examinations mademoiselle marguerite's energy and courage will flag what do you think she will reply to the man who says to her i love you and for your sake i will attempt the impossible swear to become my wife and i will establish your innocence i think she will say save me and i will marry you m de valorcy clapped his hands bravo he exclaimed you have spoken the truth remember now that your dark forebodings are only chimeras yes she will swear it and i know she is the woman to keep her vow even if she died of sorrow and the very next day i will go to the examining magistrate and say to him marguerite a thief ah what a frightful mistake 
a robbery has been committed it's true but i know the real culprit a scoundrel who fancied that by destroying a single letter he would annihilate all traces of the breach of fidelity he had committed fortunately the count de chalus distrusted this man and proof of his breach of trust is in existence i have this proof in my hands and i will show a letter establishing the truth of my assertion no forebodings clouded the marquis's joy he saw no obstacles it seemed to him as if he had already triumphed and the day following he resumed when marguerite becomes my wife i shall take from a certain drawer a certain document given to me by m de chalus when i was on the point of becoming his son-in-law and in which he recognizes marguerite as his daughter and makes her his sole legatee and this document is perfectly en règle and unattackable montmejean who has examined it guarantees that the value of the count's estate cannot be less than ten millions five will go to madame d'argelet or her son wilkie as their share of the property the remaining five will be mine come confess that the plan is admirable admirable undoubtedly but terribly complicated when there are so many wheels within wheels one of them is always sure to get out of order nonsense besides you have i don't know how many accomplices montmejean the doctor madame leon and ventrasson not counting myself will all these people perform their duties satisfactorily each of them is as much interested in my success as i am myself but we have enemies madame d'argelet fortuna madame d'argelet is about to leave paris if fortuna is troublesome i will purchase his silence montmejean has promised me money but m de corath had kept his strongest argument until the last and pascal ferrailleur said he you have forgotten him no m de valencay had not forgotten him you do not forget the man you have ruined and dishonoured still it was in a careless tone that ill accorded with his state of mind that the marquis replied the poor devil must be en route for america by this time the viscount shook his head that's what i've in vain been trying to convince myself of said he do you know that pascal was virtually expelled from the palais de justice and that his name has been struck off the list of advocates if he hasn't blown his brains out it is only because he hopes to prove his innocence ah if you knew him as well as i do you wouldn't be so tranquil in mind he stopped short for the door had suddenly opened the interruption made the marquis frown but anger gave way to anxiety when he perceived madame leon who entered the room out of breath and extremely red in the face there wasn't a cab to be had she groaned just my luck i came on foot and ran the whole way i'm utterly exhausted and so saying she sank into an armchair m de valorcet had turned very pale defer your complaints until another time he said harshly what has happened tell me the estimable woman raised her hands to heaven as she plaintively replied there is so much to tell first mademoiselle marguerite has written two letters but i have failed to discover to whom they were sent secondly she remained for more than an hour yesterday evening in the drawing-room with the general's son lieutenant gustave and on parting they shook hands like a couple of friends and said it is agreed and is that all one moment and you'll see this morning mademoiselle went out with madame de fondage to call on the baroness trigot i do not know what took place there but there must have been a terrible scene for they brought mademoiselle marguerite back unconscious in one of the baron's carriages do you hear that viscount exclaimed m de valorcet yes you shall have the explanation to-morrow answered m de corral and last but not least resumed madame leon on returning home this evening at about five o'clock i fancied i saw mademoiselle marguerite leave the house and go up the rue pigalle 
i had thought she was ill and in bed and i said to myself this is very strange so i hastened after her it was indeed she of course i followed her and what did i see why mademoiselle paused to talk with a vagabond clad in a blouse they exchanged notes and mademoiselle marguerite returned home and here i am she must certainly suspect something what is to be done if m de valorsay were frightened he did not show it many thanks for your zeal my dear lady he replied but all this is a mere nothing return home at once you will receive my instructions to-morrow chapter sixteen